Folks at home, welcome back to the Crimson Oak Pond, and if you're new to this series, we built this five acre pond over the past year, and it took us several months to get all of the dirt excavated, and we had to bring in several truckloads of clay, and we also built an island, a dock, and got all the structure in place, and then it took a couple of months to get it full of water. After that, we stocked it with a bunch of bait fish, including bluegills and threadfin shad, and not long after that, we stocked it with these little two inch aggressive bass. And we're going to be giving you an update on them here in just a minute and showing you how big they've gotten. And it's a good one because for the second week in a row, we broke the Crimson Oak record with a big female bass. We're also going to be adding a different strain of bass into the pond and having a discussion about genetics. And we've also got four baby turtles that we're going to be releasing into Cedar Falls. But first, let's get a quick update on the wildlife. And the bald eagles are quickly still in the show. When we built this eagle tower last year, I was hoping we'd have an eagle stop by at some point but never thought it would be this successful. At almost all hours of the day, you'll see different eagles stopping by, and we're pretty excited because we even had some attempting to build a nest this week. We've seen a lot of juveniles passing through, but after seeing all the rainbow trout and tasty fish in the pond, I believe this pair of adult eagles is looking to make this pond their new home. <laughs> and we also got a really cool shot. It's not every day you get to see a bald eagle hanging out on the beach. And if all this eagle activity wasn't enough, we even had an albino dove stop by the pond, so there's going to be a lot of entertaining birding activity in this video. But now I'd like to have a quick discussion about bass genetics, because we're going to be experimenting with a new strain of bass. So if you followed along with our initial pond stocking, we added a F1 tiger bass, which is a 50-50 split between a northern strain and a Florida strain. And northern bass have really aggressive traits, while the Florida strain can get up to 24 pounds but they're not nearly as aggressive. So many years back, fisheries biologists experimented by breeding 100% northern male with 100% Florida female and created what is now known as the tiger bass. And so far, stocking the tiger bass at the pond has been a success, as we've even got some bass pushing five pounds and growing at an average of three pounds per year, which is incredible. So now we're gonna talk about the future generations. So the F1 stands for first generation, and last spring, the tiger bass spawned and created that second generation, including the two bass, Johnny and June, that we put in Cedar Falls. But there's been a lot of discussions and research about the subsequent generations like the F2 and F3, or second and third generations. And what pond owners have noticed is that the future generations don't have what is known as hybrid vigor. And that's basically when a hybrid breeds with another hybrid, they don't keep those same characteristics including aggression. So we're gonna experiment with adding some pure Florida strain bass. And I had a very unique opportunity this past week. So I got invited to what I consider probably the best bass lake in the US. And just for an example, we've got one fish that we named the goat that's growing at an average of three pounds per year, while most other bass are at like a pound and a half and maybe two pounds per year. But in this particular lake, the majority of the bass were growing at an average of three pounds per year. And the owner of the lake did some genetic testing and settled in around the 95% strain and has had some incredible results. And he was kind enough to offer me some of his one-year-old females. So we're gonna add those to the pond right here before the spawn this spring and see what type of results we get out of the future generations. All right, we're back out here at the pond and I've got the Florida bass over here in the holding tank. The first thing I'm gonna do is start scooping some water out of the pond and getting them slowly acclimated. All right, they have successfully acclimated. I'm lowering the water level just to make it a little easier to get them out of there. So now we're gonna tag them with our pit tagger. We're gonna weigh them and get that documented. And these fish are gonna have a Florida theme name. So the first one I'm gonna name Gator, the second one I'm gonna name Seminole, and I'm gonna let you guys name the final four. So something Florida themed, we're looking for four more names for these bass. All right, let's get them out. All right, there we have fish number one, 16 and a half inches. And gator's gonna be 9610. And gator weighs 2.93 pounds. And so that's a one year old fish gaining three pounds per year. All right, gator, enjoy your new home. So Seminole's actually got some black markings on her head, 16 and a half inches. Seminole's gonna be 571179 and weighs 
2.82 pounds. All right, Seminole, go do your thing. Another fish with the black dots on their head. That's pretty neat. Should be easy to mark these. All right, this one is 17 inches and its tag's gonna be 570232 and weighs in at 2.55 pounds. A little more black spots on the head but you can tell it's a nice young female all right this one is 14 and a half inches and this fish is going to be 0311 and weighs 1.85 pounds so this is only a 1.8 pound female but i love the looks of that one short fat and stocky still got the black spots on the head This one even has a red lips from eating crawfish. 14 inches. This one's going to be 0576. And the run of the bunch comes in at 1.38. There's another really nice female. Look at the belly on it. 16 inches. This fish is going to be 0060 and weighs 2.38 pounds. That's exactly what we're looking for. Big female. Can't wait to see the results of this little experiment. All right, so there's the pit tags for the six bass we just added. I named the first two, and I'm looking for some names for the next four. So leave a name down in the comment section below, and make sure that it's something Florida themed. All right, let's introduce you to the newest members out here at the Crimson Oak. We got two red belly sliders, a yellow belly slider, and a red ear slider. These were just given to us by a subscriber, and we are going to put them in Cedar Falls as soon as it warms up enough. Love those colors. And so while we set up their tank, I'm going to put a couple rocks in there. And give them a place to get up out of the water. And let's get them a little habitat set up. And today's video is brought to you by Good Chop. Good Chop offers fully customizable boxes of high quality meat and seafood delivered to your door on your schedule. And there's something for everyone with grass-fed ribeyes, USDA prime fillets, wild-caught salmon, free-range chicken breast, wings, pork tenderloin, and bacon. And Good Chop sources its meat and seafood exclusively from American farms and fisheries. So today we're going to be grilling some ribeyes and shrimp, and you know we got to add that garlic butter. And I like to add a little southern flavor seasoning on the steak. And the key to grilling shrimp is make sure not to overcook them. I like how the shrimp are already peeled and deveined and ready to cook. But if you're like me and you live in a remote location, the convenience alone of not having to travel into town to a grocery store makes a box of meat and seafood from Good Chop well worth it. So give them a shot by going to goodchop.com YouTube and use code BAMABASS120 or click the link in the video description to get $120 off across your first four boxes. That's a fine deal, folks, and they also offer a 100% money back guarantee. You can't beat that. And I'm actually gonna use the same enclosure that we used to use for our pet ninja turtles several years back. But a big shout out to one of our subscribers named Richard and his three-year-old daughter. They were kind enough to give us the turtles, and I think they're gonna make a great addition. And right in the middle of setting up the enclosure, we started getting the rain. So that takes care of the water problem. But baby turtles bring back a lot of good memories because our daughter Sarah loves them. But here's one last look at them. Spring is finally in the air and it's time for them to move into the pond. All right, time to finally release the turtles into the pond. We're gonna put them out here on Turtle Beach. See what they think about the sand for a second. This may be their first time ever getting to hang out on a beach area. Love the belly on that one. And it's a turtle race who can make it to the pond first you see we got some deer tracks there <laughs> looks like a little fawns made it out here to the beach and there's probably going to be a lot of comments in today's video because we're going to need four names for these guys as well and we finally got one of them brave enough but he's running in the wrong direction so let's move him over to the pond and that's one thing i love about adding baby turtles or even newly hatched fish to a new pond because it's gonna be their first time experiencing everything. 
the sand on the beach, swimming in a little deeper water, the aquatic plants, all the wooden pieces that they'll eventually crawl out and sun on. So it's probably a pretty exciting day for these little guys. <laughs> and one thing I remember about them is the little ones <laughs> chomp at everything. They're not really 100% sure what's food and what's not. So they give everything a taste test. But this little one's exploring. He's not really sure if he wants to go off in that deep water yet. But one other good thing about this pond is since we started out with small fish, we're able to add these baby turtles. Because it's not too common, but I have seen pictures of a big large mouth with a turtle in its mouth. So these three guys are still just hanging out. Let's go ahead and get you in the water, little guy. <laughs> Check that out. We got one of them trying to bury himself in the sand and the other headed for deep water. And that will be interesting to see. I know that some turtles bury themselves in the mud during winter time and kind of go into a hibernation. And I guess there's a potential they could do that in the beach sand. So this little guy with the orange belly is definitely the explorer of the bunch. He's swimming up to take a peek. And he's still a little bit skittish. I could watch these guys all day. But so far they seem to be happy with their new home. And I think they're great little additions. But I mentioned that spring was in there. And you can see those aquatic plants starting to bud. And that's why spring is my favorite time of year. And this pond's about to come to life. But back to the albino dove. And there's also another term for it. Because it may just be a white dove and not truly albino. I think usually you can tell by the redness around the eye. But either way, I think it's a positive sign. And this guy's been here for several months, but this is the first time I was able to get him on film. And he must be pretty skilled because he stands out like a sore thumb. And with all these predators, including the hawks, eagles, and owls, I can't believe he made it this long. So in the last video, we discovered snails hanging out around the pond's edge. And there were some mixed comments in the video. And most people think they're beneficial for ponds. But a couple people did say that they could carry a parasite that could infect the bass. So I do think we're going to add some shell crackers to the pond this spring. Several people also said that rainbow trout eat them. So another perk of adding the trout. And we got another visit from one of my favorite farm animals out here. And that's the fox squirrel that we call Foxy. And we got to thinking about it. And we've built houses for almost every type of animal out here. Including duck houses, an eagle tower. So I'm partnering up with Nate Makes. And we're going to build not one, but two squirrel houses. And we're going to start building them next week. But I'd like to get some feedback from you guys about anything we should add in the houses. We're not adding any tech, but we've thought about things like rainwater collection. But any interesting ideas you have, let us know and we'll try to incorporate it into the houses. And ever since we had the tilapia die off, we've seen a big variety of new eagles stopping by. But for this particular pair of adults, once they found the rainbow trout, they have not left since. Pretty much any time of the day you look out there, you're going to see them hanging out somewhere around the pond. They've also started timing the bluegill feeders and swooping down each time they go off. Right now they're about 50-50 of catching one or not. But by far the most interesting thing we saw on the cameras this past week was they started bringing what I'm considering nesting materials up to the platform. And they brought up things like straw and cardboard but as you'll see in these clips, the platform design and high winds aren't ideal for building a nest. So I'm thinking it's time to probably make some modifications and maybe add some vertical boards on the side to keep the wind from blowing the sticks and nesting material off. So let me know what you guys think about that. I'm no eagle expert, but they're showing interest. So I definitely want to help them out any way I can. And I've seen a bunch of videos of an adult eagle feeding its baby. But if you ever wanted to know if an adult eagle is friendly enough to share with its partner, <laughs> the answer is no. This eagle was not sharing that bluegill. And you can see one of them snacking on the fish and then decides to go down and take a drink out of the pond. And I can just tell you guys, nothing makes me happier than seeing all the wildlife interact with the things we built out here at the farm. Years ago, when this was just a peanut field, they probably would have flown right over and never stopped. But getting to watch them interact with the things we built and even feeding them some fresh fish really has been the coolest part of all these projects. 
<laughs> and he just had to run the crow off. Then he landed on the owl house. And speaking of owls, Hooter, the smallest of the two, utilizes the Eagle Tower at night. You can see we even got a full moon shining off the water. And now that I think about it, if the eagles do make this their nesting site, we may have some turf wars in the future because the owls were definitely here first. So now that winter time's over, the bass have moved out of the deep water and back up shallow so we can start doing our night feeding segments again. But I got some pretty exciting news and I'm about 90% sure that one of these bass coming up tonight is our big female pet bass that we put in the pond last year. And I don't even think I have to pause the videos and show you. You'll see that there's obviously one fish that is much, much bigger than the rest. So Bonnie, if that is you, happy to see you again. But that does lead me to our next project. And over the past few months, we've been working with the same company that builds our pit tag injector and reader to design these underwater antennas so each time a bass that's been tagged swims by one of these antenna locations, it's gonna ping back to a data logger and we're gonna be able to track the movements of all of the bass around the pond. So for instance, we're gonna install an antenna right here by the green light at the dock. And this time next week or maybe the week after, I would be able to tell you for certain whether or not that was Bonnie or Clyde swimming by the light. So that's something I feel like we're gonna be able to get some incredible data from and I'm looking forward to it. But I've probably got about 12 bass down here that come up at night, and I've probably fed them somewhere between 300 and 400 golden shiners. And they remind me of Moby. They'll eat as long as you keep feeding them. So at some point, I just gotta stop. And it's a full moon tonight, so you know we gotta put out the time lapse. But you're about to see something pretty interesting. So at some point throughout the night, an animal walked by and tipped the camera over, and right before it tipped completely over, Pay attention to all the snail activity. And I don't see much out of them throughout the day. So I'm guessing that snails are big nighttime feeders. All right, folks, time to do a little fishing. We got a lot of wind out here today, so we're gonna be fishing with the chatterbait. But if you're not familiar with it, every time we catch a bass, we'll either tag it, or if it's already been tagged, we'll scan it and see what their pit tag number is. And then we'll go back and look at our database and see how much it's grown since the last time we caught it. But I'm pretty excited because here in about two or three weeks, I have a feeling a lot of these fish are gonna be pulling up into these shallow pockets and starting their spawn. And the spring spawn is one of my favorite times of the year. And not only that, the fish are the biggest they'll be all year right now. So let's see if we can break another record. Here. Fighting weird. It's a big fish. Nice one. Wow. Big fish. That's what I'm talking about. No way that's the goat again. Let's go find out. Ate the chatterbait good. No, that can't be the goat. Ah, uh, it's the goat again. Can't believe it. We're not gonna stress her. You can see she got a belly full of eggs. Oh goat, nice to see you again. But guys, you can see I'm out here completely on the opposite side of the pond. The last time we caught the goat was off the dock. I purposely came over here to catch a different group of fish, but <laughs> I guess the goat's just swimming around eating everything. And if you missed our last video, we had a five-year-old named Cole who caught the goat and we weighed him at 4.71 pounds. And since it was just a week or two later, I didn't want to add extra stress because after all, those big females are the ones we need to protect. There we go. Got another nice one. They're piled in over here. Nice healthy one. Mm -hmm. Alright, this fish is 571185 and it weighs 2.22 pounds. So this fish was named Guppy and we caught it last June and it's gained a pound since then, which is exactly what you want to see. Okay. 
healthy one. Got the green spot right there on the nose. All right, this one has not been caught. And it's gonna be 70599. It weighs 1.41 pounds. It's a good one. <laughs> a little fighter on her hands. Nice fish. Pale. It's been a lot of time out. I've noticed they've got a, a lot of them have that little black spot right there on their gill. All right, this one hasn't been caught either. 14 and a half inches. This fish is going to be 69861, and it weighs 1.78 pounds. Another nice one. And Sarah's also been doing a lot of fishing ever since she caught a rainbow trout, and they've been her favorite. Go, Sarah, pull. Go, 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 go. You got him this time. You got him. All right, he's pulling drag. <laughs> Is it a big one? It's a little bitty bluegill. Ate your salmon egg. All right. <laughs> and I'd say Oliver is definitely going to be a fisherman because he's absolutely interested in the bluegill. We got the bobcat still hanging out. These bucks in South Alabama are still rutting in mid-February. That's pretty wild to see because the rut's been over for months in every other part of the country. Now it's time to feed Mr. Tiger. All right, folks, that's going to wrap up this video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button to follow along with all these pond projects and pets we have. Hope you all enjoyed this one, and we will see you all next time.